All right, welcome to the new JFK show number 201. And we do have a long way to go till we hit the 300 mark. But with Larry Rivera and Dr. Fetzer and, and Don Fox, I have a feeling it's not going to be all that difficult. So we promise to march on with as much real truth and information as we possibly can. All right, so we have a full crew tonight, and I'm going to go ahead and take the screen share. Go ahead and pause for a second, Dr. Fetzer. Three, all right. Zoom. Okay, um, we have a new, uh, came out in 2015, and come to find out, 52 years on, photos of, Jack, of JFK's assassin confirmed as authentic. Now, Larry, you've always told me that you've asked people to replicate your work, so these people seem that who have answered the call here. Well, right. that's, that's Annie Fareed. I'll let Jim, uh, you know, talk to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I blew this apart. I published at least three oh, blogs really? about this. Jim Mars and I did our did our co-authored piece on framing the patsy, the case of Lee Harvey Oswald, taking apart the backyard photographs. I even published about, you know, what a scandal this was for Dartmouth to have this right. lab funded by the FBI. This guy's an FBI stooge on the faculty of Dartmouth College, completely outrageous. Yeah. Okay. Well, go ahead, Larry. Tell, 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 tell us what you really think of this guy. <laughs> well, well, you know, we don't have to, you know, I mean, this is done as far as I'm concerned. You know, this, well, is, right. this is my book, you know, and, and uh, we, we uh, wanted to bring this to the trial about in the, this past November that uh, the man who posed for that is actually Roscoe White. And we did the overlays and we proved it beyond any uh, reasonable doubt. And Gary, I think this is uh, really... Uh, In the bag? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Jim... Oh, Jim okay, well, maybe I, we can take it a, just a I, step further here. I think Jim um, even wrote, I think Jim even wrote uh, Dartmouth College, didn't I you? I did. I wrote to the president. All right, well, let's take, right, let's take right. a look here at what um, this guy is doing in other places. All right, so... Stage Palestinian photo. So they're bringing this guy in to uh, use his photo analysis to, sh to say that these Israeli atrocities are just fake photos, you see? But let's think about it a minute. Larry has completely blown away the backyard photos. So are we to trust him here that the Israeli atrocities are fake photos as well? So, it's, so I, I took a little time out and... Um, Come to find out, our guy here is um, working the other side of the street. So just like uh, Don was saying, you know, we have the uh, magic bullet theory. So we got a group of people together. And not that long ago, we had a mock trial. And then what did we have? I'm not even going to ring the bell. Okay, so now we have people attacking <laughs> our work. And come to find out, well, I have a couple of pictures there. Let me go ahead and pull them up. Do the full screen. All right. I thought I discovered all this today, fellas. Let's go, go full screen there. Yeah, yeah. I think I did. Well, it's not full screen here. Okay. I hit slideshow. Yeah, there we go. There we go. All right, so we checked him out. Wait, hold on. So we checked him out, and you're right, and his big – Claim to fame is that he disproved these uh, pictures right here. Except and, he uh, did, and he only looked at the nose. The whole thing was ridiculous. It was complete bullshit. What would you say about the nose? <laughs> All no, he did no. was look at the nose and the nose shadow. He didn't confirm the authenticity of anything. Okay. Well, Ooh. here's our two accomplices right here. And um, that's the third guy right here. So, anyway... And um, nose. here's another guy right here that um, we're just going to have to take our hats off, who was a complete outspoken champion of Israel. Now, we always knew that, right, Don? Charles Krauthammer, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I don't even – well, I, you know, I hate to bash a dead guy here, but, you know, he was a Jew, and uh, – he inflicted a lot of Jewish propaganda on the American public over the years. And I certainly am not going to miss his contributions. Yeah. I could always tell that. All right. So next up, we've got a video here. 
that we're going to play. One of them is Dr. Fetcher's, and I'm going to play mine first. So here we go. Actually, I grew to like a crowd hammer, you know, in his later days. I thought he had very perceptive political commentary, but he certainly did have a bias in favor of Israel, no doubt about it. No question. Oh, one thing real quick. Let me get the volume up. All right, here we go. This is when LBJ had JFK's possessions removed from Washington or from the White House. So here we go, fellas. We're not seeing the video, Gary. That old. Hold on. Dog on it. I forgot to hit screen. It reminded me of that old saying, the king is dead, long live the king. I don't know how that happens in royalty, but when the king is dead, everybody turns long live the king and they know who the next king is. Uh, there's got to be some kind of a moment of uh, difficulty for the new king as well as for the family of the old king. And that was typical of what happened in the White House. The Kennedy people were devastated by death and loss of power. And that was beginning to set in. That wasn't theirs anymore. And Johnson, uh, nevertheless, had the power that he'd relished all his life. And the Johnson people. And there was an exhilaration. When we were at the hospital, Bobby says to me, would you get down to the office tomorrow morning early? The Johnson people are in there already. And at 8.30, LBJ came in and said to me, Miss Lincoln, would you come into the office with me? I walked in the Oval Office. He said, uh, I need you more than you need me. He said, would, could you get all of this all of the candidates' uh, possessions out of the Oval Office, your office, in the cabinet room by nine o'clock. I said, nine o'clock? I said, I don't know. I'll let you know. I went to Bobby, and Bobby just could not understand it. Johnson, I think, probably had his reasons for doing it, uh, but it did cause a certain amount of resentment. I mean, it seemed to haste, seemed unseen. All right, there you go. <clears throat> go ahead, Now, Johnson was a POS. What else can we say? I mean, didn't even wait until the body was cold. That's right. Uh, it's the very next day at 1 o'clock, and he's already calling the secretary to clean everything up. Just amazing. You know, it's almost like he had foreknowledge or something. Almost. As though. Uh, they had the boxes all ready to go and the U-Haul rented. So, all right, so we're going to go ahead and play. Uh, another, are you? Another, another one of history's coincidences. <laughs> That's right. One of those amazing <laughs> mysteries. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, so let me go ahead and share. So I believe that in that same video, Evelyn Lincoln talks about the uh, incident that Jim has written so many times about uh, when they were deciding who was going to be on the ticket. And Evelyn Lincoln uh, describes that moment uh, in vivid detail where uh, him, uh, JFK and RFK were in the hotel room, you know, discussing this in deep thought. And obviously uh, what uh, Jim has said so many times about uh, uh, Johnson LBJ uh, telling, uh, you know, laying down, you know, the, uh, the whip there saying, hey, you know, if I'm not on the ticket, you know, none of your uh, legislation is going to get through, you know, and this is what's going to happen. And, and your health, you know, all the secrets of your health are going to be revealed, you know, so, uh, yeah. yeah. She was a good and faithful person, highly intelligent, totally competent, wonderful person. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, LBJ got all of his possessions out of the White House, and then he got L then he got JFK's body 
off of the, the uh, White House grounds. What's next? that from left to right robert teddy cardinal cushing and secretary mcnair obser observing reinterment at permanent gravesite president's casket being uncovered Robert Kennedy observing the uncovering of the president's gravesite. Mr. Metzler, Superintendent Arlington Cemetery, talking to Teddy Kennedy while observing uncovering of the president's grave. Robert Kennedy and Secretary McNamara at the grave site of President Kennedy during the reinternment. President's casket being lifted to permanent site. President's casket lowered at permanent grave site. President's casket lowered at permanent site. Cardinal Cushing observing the permanent gravesite. These photos are all dated 14 March, 1967. Yes. President's casket and position at new gravesite, Robert and Tennedy, Teddy Kennedy observing. Okay. I have a quick question. Where was he buried before? Was it on the White House grounds? No, no, it was always in Arlington. No, this is when they moved to the, the eternal flame, the permanent. Right, but he was always in Arlington Cemetery? Yeah. Okay, well, I must have misread about um, him, Johnson. Kennedy infant daughter being lowered in permanent gravesite. Kennedy infant daughter being lowered in permanent site. This is very macabre. It is. Following image, you can see the eternal flame. Yeah. Cardinal Cushing praying over new sight. Mm -hmm. 
Teddy Kennedy observing permanent site after Cardinal Cushing prayer. President's casket at permanent gravesite. Robert Kennedy at new site after reinternment and before covering casket. It's on an angle. Uh, President's casket complete after being covered. his brother's grave. Military exhumation was done in the middle of the night. RFK and EMK, as well as Robert McNamara, were there. EMK. Uh, Edward. Edward. Yeah, sure, of course. These pictures were taken by a journalist who was arrested because of the pictures he took. 
it did seem that he there was a busy photographer there for sure. Well, it's too bad they didn't look inside the casket to see if actually Jack was inside because. You know, when I went to Washington for a conference, I went out to JFK's grave and I don't know what came over me, but just something was overwhelming to me that he wasn't there. Yeah. It, it just felt empty to me. And I, I don't know why I, I can't explain it. And um, it just, I just felt it in my soul that he wasn't there. I think it would be highly probably he's not there, Gary. They wouldn't want there to be a, a disinterment and an examination of the body even today. Yeah, I guess eventually they could go in there and take a look, but um, they're just not going to let it happen under any circumstances. You're absolutely right. Well, I have to say, fellas, after our big anniversary show, this is about as solemn as it gets. <laughs> I mean, I feel depressed. <laughs> What's interesting, those photographs weren't even arranged in proper temporal sequence. I'm rather surprised by that. Yeah, it was um, very, uh, I feel like I attended a funeral. What, what did you make of it, Larry? Very macabre, very, uh, very weird. <laughs> you know, obviously, you know, the, the photos uh, are very low resolution. You know, there's not much that uh, you can uh, you know, say about any of this. So, you know, it's, yeah. probably it was propaganda. Yeah. They were like um, Polaroid, you know, the Polaroids where you take it and you peel it and let it dry. It seemed like it was that kind of photograph. Well, I mean, we're, we do a show every week on a presidential assassination where the man had his brains blown out at high noon in the streets of Dallas. So a macabre video yeah. may, may be right at home in a show funny. like this. Yeah, sure. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's not a fiesta every week. You're right. <laughs> but so you want to take a break? Is this about the half of the show or what? Uh, we have a little bit of sand left. Okay. Uh, we're going we to Larry. Switch, to Larry. switch to Larry. Yeah, go ahead and pause and we'll get Larry going. Okay. You want me to pause? Yeah. All right, now let's on to Larry Rivera with his new documents. You wanted the documents, Larry's got the documents. Go ahead, Larry. We've got the documents. That's right. <laughs> Where's the beef? <laughs> Remember? Well, yeah, uh, you know, I have uh, found a lot of documents that were uh, found in uh, Joseph Califano's files and which were now, uh, which have now been released um, by the ARB. And I must say that it's a trove of information. You know, they're called the Califano Papers uh, and it has to do with a lot of information inside information that had to do with the Joint Chiefs, you know, the JCS records. And uh, some of the stuff in there, Jim, is just outrageous, you know. And I think uh, it's going to be a lot of fun here to review uh, some of the uh, names of uh, some of the operations that were being conducted at the time where the CIA was trying to get rid of Fidel Castro. And uh, actually this... Uh, it, you know, the different operations and the names, you know, of the, uh, of the operations, it just made me laugh, you know, when I went over this, I thought, uh, you know, we should uh, take a look at some of this. And, uh, you know, basically, uh, these are uh, Califano's files. And uh, uh, this, this one in particular, which was released by the uh, JFK Assassination Review Board, uh, has to do with Cuba. A lot of them have to do with Cuba, but this one in particular just caught my eye because, you know, it was just outrageous. And uh, I, wanna, I wanted to share it with you guys here uh, tonight because, it, it, as it says here, uh, possible actions to provoke, harass, or disrupt Cuba, Northwoods documents, we all know about Northwoods, courses of action uh, related to Cuba, uh, and, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, a contingency plan for a coup in, in Cuba. So, you know, Northwoods was not the only operation, Jim, that, uh, that uh, the uh, Joint Chiefs had devised to uh, bring about, you know, a reason or a prov uh, provocation to uh, invade Cuba and, and get rid of Fidel Castro. 
some of these that we're going to look at here, you know, some of them are just so funny that I just couldn't, you know, I, I just couldn't stop laughing. For example, if you look here at number one, okay, and I think uh, Jim should take it over here, possible actions. Op to promote. Operation Smasher, objective to disrupt the military. Before that, possible actions to provoke, harass, or disrupt Cuba. <laughs> right. <laughs> Operation Smasher, objective. The objective is to disrupt disabled military and commercial communications facilities in Cuba. Concept. This is to be accomplished by the clandestine introduction of a special vacuum tube into selected communications equipment. The tube, which is available, is virtually undetectable inasmuch as its effectiveness is due to insertion of a chemical compound at the base of the tube. The chemical, when heated, becomes a conductor. When cool, a non-conductor. <laughs> Another operation, free ride. Objective, the objective is to create unrest and dissension among the Cuban people. Concept, this might be accomplished by airdropping valid Pan American or KLM one-way airline tickets. Good for passage to Mexico City, Caracas, etc. <laughs> none to the U.S. Tickets can be intermingled with other leaflets planned to be dropped. The number of tickets dropped could be increased. The validity of the tickets would have to be restricted to a time. Have you ever heard of something like that, Jim? Man, these no. guys are out of, no. out of control, man. <laughs> uh, Operation never... Turnabout, objective. The objective is to create indications of Fidel Castro that is value to the revolutionary cause has diminished to the point where plans are being made for his removal concept. This is to be accomplished by the use of intelligence means that crescendo increasing until it culminates in Castro's discovery of the mechanism or hardware. You know, I have to say this. Do you know that these assholes put an antenna in a cat's tail so they could eavesdrop on people in different rooms? They're just out of control. Like JFK said, these are a bunch of kids that never grew up and they want to play with real toys. It gets better. It gets better. Operation Defector, objective to induce elements or individuals of the Cuban military to defect with equipment concept. This activity, when properly planned and implemented, has the effect of decreasing military capability. In a totalitarian system, the immediate reaction is increased security accompanied by decreased activity. It also creates havoc in security and intelligence agencies, could be accomplished by intelligence means and promise of reward. These are all just, this is just, you know. I, disgusting. <laughs> well, it really is. this is off the top of their heads, it virtually sounds. Operation Breakup, objective to clandestinely introduce corrosive materials to call aircraft, vehicle, or boat accidents, concept. <laughs> this, this, yeah, brainstorming. This activity, if possible, should be aimed primarily toward the Soviet-provided aircraft. If properly accomplished, it would degrade confidence in the equipment increase supply and maintenance problems and seriously affect combat capability. Operation cover-up objective. The objective is to convince the communist government of Cuba that naval forces ostensibly assigned to the Mercury project merely a cover concept. It should not be revealed as to what the cover is. Just to be left to conjecture. This could tie in with Operation Dirty Trick. Which is next. <laughs> Operation Dirty Trick objective. The objective is to provide irrevocable proof that should the Mercury manned orbit flight fail, the fault lies with communists at all Cuba. Concept, this is to be accomplished by manufacturing various pieces of evidence, which would prove electronic interference on the part of the Cubans. In other words, I want to make a comment on that one, Jim. You manufacture uh, evidence. Wait, wait, wait. If, if they were capable of doing this, wouldn't they have been capable of doing the same thing to the Apollo uh, uh, capsule that took the lives of Gus Grissom, Ed White, sure. and Kathy. Sure, you know. okay. absolutely, 100%. Yeah. Operation Full Up, objective, the operation is to destroy confidence in fuel supplied by the Soviet bloc by indicating it is contaminated. <laughs> concept this is to be accomplished by introducing a known biological agent into jet fuel storage facilities this agent flourishes in jet fuel and grows until it consumes all the space inside the tank operation phantom objective the objective is to convince the castro government that clandestine penetration and resupply of agents is being regularly conducted concept 
This is to be accomplished by use of BJ, UDT, and JJ capabilities to create the impression that landings have been made on beaches and airdrops have been made in other areas. Operation Bingo. <laughs> objective. The objective is to create an incident which has the appearance of an attack on U.S. facilities, GMO in Cuba. Guantanamo. 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 Yeah, good. Thus providing the excuse for the U.S. military might to overthrow the current governor, or, you know, a false flag. Concept. Yeah, okay, I know. Exactly, exactly. This should be accomplished use of snakes outside the confines of Guantanamo Bay. Snakes simulate an actual firefight. And upon hearing such a sound, it's entirely feasible. The immediate reaction on Gitmo would be that the base is being attacked. This would, with proper preparation, be followed by a counterattack with adequate planning. The basic Gitmo could discharge, disgorge military force in sufficient number to sustain itself until other forces, which had been previously alerted, could attack in other areas. That's envisaged. A schedule of operations similar to the following to overwhelm the Cuban military and cause its defeat. A simulated attack on Guantanamo. Word flashed to the president. President orders counterattack to include. Immediate launch of alerted aircraft whose targets are Cuban airfields. Immediate launch of counterattack down strategic lines and communication in Cuba. Fleet force standing by on alert would make way forward. Pre-select the targets, landing areas. Immediate embarkation of airborne troops previously alerted to pre-selected targets. Launch of additional combat aircraft to cure drop areas and further interdict lines of communication. Ships and aircraft would land, airdrop troops, and secure airfields, road, railroad uh, terminals, etc. Uh, resupply and replacement activities properly executed. The above could overthrow the Cuban government in a matter of hours, providing the plan is implemented within the next six months. This is a bunch of conspiracy theories. <laughs> Coming directly from the Department of Defense. <laughs> Operation Good Times. Good times, a series, yeah, the one yeah. that Objective, that was happy day. I don't mind. JJ. Yeah, I don't mind. Objective, the disillusion. I don't mind. To disillusion <laughs> the Cuban population with Castro image by distribution of fake photographic material concept. Prepare a desired photograph such as an obese Castro with two beauties in any situation desired. <laughs> Ostensibly within a room in the Castro residence, lavishly furnished on table, brimming over with the most delectable Cuban food with an underlying caption, appropriately Cuban, such as my ration is different. Make as many prints as desired on sterile paper and then distribute over the countryside by airdrops or agent. This would put even a commie dictator in the proper perspective with the underprivileged masses. <laughs> this is the wow. kind of thing they were doing on Orgy Island, you know, getting, except they were getting real politicians in real compromising position with underage kids and filming it. Operation Heat is on objective to create the impression with Castro government that certain died in the wool red pilots are planning to defect, thus causing a detrimental tightening of security concept. It is known that many Cuban refugee pilots are personally acquainted with many of the present CRAF pilots accordingly by utilizing all sources available. Determine the name of those pilots considered to be dedicated Castro Reds, then by use of agents, communication, etc., inject into the Castro intelligence system the fact that these pre-designated Reds are planning to defect for monetary and or ideological reasons, security crackdown should help destroy Castro image and also impose unacceptable restrictions on routine training activities. Well, you know, I, it, I think it was going to work. You want yeah. me to continue? You want me to continue? Yeah, man, this is fun. Wow. Operation, Operation Invisible Bomb. <laughs> no. what? There we go, 9-11. To create the impression that isolated bombings are taking place in Cuba, thus maximizing harassment and confusion of the Castro government concept. The Air Force can utilize the operational characteristics of F-101 or other Century Series aircraft. And by the way, the difference in the format tells me this was actually typed on a different occasion than the previous ones. This is an addendum. Yeah, what's, what's the date on all this stuff, uh, Larry? Uh, this is, uh, I'll check it in a minute. Uh, it is uh, 62, uh, probably. I'll check, it, I'll check it for you in a second. I was going to say, it, it, 
it seems similar to stuff I've seen from like 61 or 62. Yeah. Yeah. Concept of operation. The Air Force can utilize the operational characteristics of F-101 or other Century Series aircraft to create the impression that anti-Castro opposition is continuing. The aircraft operational characteristics to be applied, exploited is the sonic boom. <laughs> the sonic boom can be employed in several different ways, such as an individual boom at selected spots or a continuous boom performed at either high or low altitudes. It will cause not only apprehension, but varying degrees of malicious damage as well. For example, break all the windows on a <laughs> Oh, man. Hey, they brought Chuck Yeager in there, too. The sonic boot effect can be maximized by planning missions for execution during the early morning hours when the populace is sleeping. The Cuban people are generally unfamiliar with this phenomenon. Therefore, it's felt that the impact for a time would be most beneficial. The directional aspect of the sonic boon also make it feasible to use in simulating U.S. naval gunfire in the immediate vicinity of the Cuban landmass. This operation is considered relatively safe and leaves no tangible evidence it can be planned and executed with a minimum of effort and expense. What a qualified bullshit. <laughs> operation Horn Swoggle objective. Now, this is back in the earlier format. To crash or force down a Cuban, well, actually, it's not quite. To crash or force down Cuban MiG aircraft with all weather interceptor capability by communications intrusion, concept of operations, closely monitor MiG air ground communication for the purpose of determining frequency and terminology usage for practice or real GCI operations by use of overriding transmitters in either a decoy aircraft or solid weather conditions. Uh, override Cuban controller and have air, Cuban refugee pilot issue instructions which run in MIG out of fuel or toward Florida, Puerto Rico, Jamaica, Jamaica, Perry, or et cetera. Well, uh, you know, and it just goes on and on, Jim. You know, I don't know if you guys, yeah, I think this, yeah, this is the end of it right here. All right. Operation True Belief, objective True. to decray Castro and his government in the eyes of the Cuban people by communication intrusion. Concept of operation? By utilizing high-powered transmitters in the vicinity of Cuba, Florida, in Agua, Jamaica, board naval ship, which have the capability of overriding commercial Cuban radio and TV stations, periodically degrade Castro and other government figures in the minds of the Cuban people. The technique of communication intrusion could be exploited by pre-taping or live broadcasts of anti-communist and anti-Castro propaganda at station breaks, Castro speeches, etc. This idea envisions the use of a Cuban refugee to make such broadcasts and naturally would require close monitoring of stations to be worked. Any number of thoughts could be injected, such as Cuba, see, si, Russia, no. Communism exploits the masses. Communism is ruthless totalitarianism. Castro and he henchmen feast off the land while we are raised and Castro and his reign of terror. Castro is a lunatic and should be put away. Castro is the cause of all our troubles. Rise up against the pig, Castro, et cetera, et cetera. If approved, this operation could become a continuous project, perhaps under control of USIA, that's U.S. Information Agency. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, uh, yeah, this is uh, 1962, as I uh, said. The, the, you know. Notice it was, a, it was for Lansdale. Yeah, 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 of course. Uh, you know, possible use of, you know, objective. Uh, is, this, is this not what we have done to us every single day? Crap like this being yeah. pushed on us. Yeah. It's the well, same. You know, Operate. Yeah, here's more, here's more, right? Oh, you want to look at this? Yeah. Operation No Love Lost. Objective to confuse and harass Castro Cuban pilots by use of radio conversations. Concept of operation. Fly Cuban refugee pilot in sterile aircraft in proximity of Cuba at periodic interval while communications monitoring Cuban air ground frequencies utilized for aerodrome control. Cuba refugee pilot in sterile aircraft would personally know many of the pilots still flying for Castro. Refugee pilot would get into argument with Castro pilots over radio. That's distracting, confusing, etc. would be real trouble for Castro pilots in actual weather conditions. Argument could go, I'll get you, you red son of a gun, and call by name if appropriate. 
Some of this, some, I know, I know. It's, some of this stuff is just outrageous, but at the same and time, they get paid for them. They get paid. Yeah. Some of the at the same time, a lot of this stuff reveals technology that was only available uh, to the military and the CIA at the, at the time, Jim. You know, some of this stuff, you know, is yeah, real. yeah. So it's quite revealing, you know, in that regard. So, uh, but Can we begin with Operation Smasher. I guess this is an expanded version. Yeah, so, so you know, basically, you know, I, I found this when I saw this, you know, it's so harebrained. Yeah. yeah, it repeats itself. Good, Larry, it's good. This is for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, you know, and we're talking about Northwoods, you know, and uh, and then you get all of this other, you know. Yeah, that we're more familiar with, yeah. You know, and you've got false flag operations. You've got all kinds of technology, uh, jamming signals. You've got radio, TV transmissions, you know, leaflets. and I mean, I thought the most outrageous one was, the drop uh, 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 airplane tickets, you know, one-way tickets. <laughs> yeah, one-way tickets. Anywhere too. except the U.S. <laughs> yeah. I like the one about the vacuum tube, you know, where they're going to put a vacuum tube that turns yeah. on and off. Yeah. yeah. yeah also so I don't, think, I don't <laughs> think anybody's ever, you know, uh, seen this document or has even discussed this, you know, again, you know, we're the first ones, you know, but wow, you know, I, I'm just amazed, you know, to see. And it shows the era too, because I think the transistor was just about to be invented, or it had uh, just been invented. So they were still working. No, no, stay there, stay there, Gary. Go down to two here. I want to uh, read this. The the two, yeah, right, right there. The 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 basis, the basic military implications of Castro's communist government are as follows. It exposes the Western Hemisphere to an increasingly serious threat to its security. This increases our national vulnerability and defense costs as forces are developed or shifted to meet this threat. It provides the Soviet Union with the most effective base they have ever had for spreading communism throughout the Western Hemisphere. This in turn greatly increases the possibility that additional Latin American countries will come under communist control. Elimination of this base would demonstrate to other nations of the world that the United States will not tolerate such intrusions. Communist control of additional countries would or could result in increased communist capability for a a a attack on other nations of the Western Hemisphere, increased communist capability for spreading communism throughout Latin America, the loss of existing and or potential bases, training areas, facilities, and rights, as well as sources of strategic materials necessary to our military capability, an increased threat to U.S. usage and control of the Panama Canal through subversion and sabotage. The urgency of the requirement to remove the communist government from Cuba is made apparent by Castro's constantly increasing capabilities for attacking other nations of the Western Hemisphere and for spreading communism throughout the hemisphere. The sense of urgency is greatly increased if courses of action within the capability of the communists are considered. The Soviets could establish land, sea, and or air bases in Cuba. The Soviets could provide Castro with a number of ballistic missiles with nuclear warheads, which they actually did. Mm -hmm. And they could furnish the missiles and maintain joint control of the nuclear warheads. In view of the factors set forth above, the Department of Defense holds the communist regime in Cuba is incompatible with the minimum security requirements of the Western Hemisphere. The Department of Defense is prepared to overtly support any popular movement inside Cuba to the extent of ousting the communist regime and installing a government acceptable to the United States, while the possibility of communist bloc reactions in areas other than Cuba is recognized. It is believed that this can be accomplished without precipitating general war and without serious effect on world public opinion if the following conditions prevail. Well, you know, this goes, you know, on and on. You're talking, yeah. you're talking about 199 pages. We're on 33, Jim, so we could go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's just, just outrageous, you know, the uh, schemes, you know, that uh, he got Lemnitzer, you know, involved in this also, you know, and you know, right. you know how, you know, how him and Curtis LeMay, you know, were mortal enemies of JFK. So, uh, well, I Lemnitzer, understand that, that the Joint Chiefs actually signed the National uh, Security Memorandum authorizing the assassination of JFK. Yeah, and, no, and notice the date here, 13 March 1962. So this is after the Bay of Pigs. This is before the uh, the missile crisis of, of October. 
So, you know, JFK is caught, you know, in all of this, you know, and nowhere in here do you see that, uh, you know, the commander in chief is being advised of all of these plans. Of anything. Yeah. Yeah. Right, because they know they know he would not approve any of this. They're crime. running. They're running their own little, you know, uh, scheme here. Government, the government. Good, Larry. Yeah. You know, so uh, you know anybody. Uh, this is there. This is in uh, in the April uh, release. You know, and I just you know when I first ran across this, you know, it's just outrageous. You know, it goes on and on. You know, uh, wow. Let me see. Blow up ammunition inside the base. Yeah, back up just a hair there. Um, What's that? Back up just to hear there were a list there of uh, uh, of atrocities they could perpetrate. That oh sure sure let me see uh, yeah well you know uh, Northwoods you know they wanted to you know uh, shoot down uh, airlines you know airlines right. and everything college students and all that yeah yeah uh, so you know it's that's not, okay Larry you got it it's all there yeah I think I think the point is uh, has been transmitted here Jim you know but uh, I just thought that. These uh, names were so colorful, you know. They we we should uh, talk about them, you know. <laughs> right. Who, 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 and they pull this crap on the American people every day, every no, day. And 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 you can see that the false flag uh, thing, you know, is is already being deeply uh, entrenched. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The following yeah, persons his, were president. Yeah, this is 18 December after the assassination. Who was the president at the time? This is the first time that you see. Okay, this is where we're talking with the president. And this is the very first time. It's already when JFK is dead, you know. <laughs> yeah, now they're yeah now they're talking to the president. Yeah, nice now point. Yeah, he's already. This is the new president. Yeah, of course, right. of course, of course. So, okay. you know, he's all in. Yeah. LBJ was all in for this kind of, you know yeah. what? That's why they. That's that's why they killed him. He wouldn't go along with things like this. So, uh, Joint Chiefs of Chat of Staff, you know, the real bosses. Uh, yeah, so anyway, I'm going to stop the share and uh, let you guys. Uh, get right. Right. Oh, that's good, Larry. Good stuff. Yeah. All right, Don, what you got for us? Okay. Um, I've got a, an article appeared in the New York Times this week. Um, I think it's kind of in, you know, in the vein of the stuff I was talking about last week with the, uh, the 65 immigration bill. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and grab the, uh, come on, grab the screen here. Share a screen. Let's go. You need me to pause? No, you're oh, good. There's um, our boy. So yeah. So last week we we were talking about the the Steinlight plan. Um, in October 2001, Jewish supremacist Stephen Steinlight published a paper entitled "The Jewish Stake in America's Changing Demography: Reconsidering a Misguided Immigration Policy." In this paper, which is freely available online, Steinlight admitted that the Jews have been behind the United States mass immigration open borders policy with the express intent of- What's the, the, what's the date on this? Um, the, he, he published the paper in October of 2001. Oh yeah, 2001. Yeah. I like that observation, the source of Jewish power in America is white guilt over the Holocaust, which as I observed then is why they have to maintain the myth. Yeah, but you better better not import so you know, he, too many too fast. So he stated he stated that uh, with uh, the the open borders and immigration policy has been the, the express intent of that policy is reducing white Americans to a minority. So okay, so this week um, wait, I, I just got to read. Go back just for a second. Okay, this was gives me hope. It says if whites become a minority too quickly. The new majority of color will no longer have any connection to or feel any guilt, you know. Over the Holocaust, yeah. But, you know, the Jews will come up with some other scam to, you know, to stay in power at that point. That'll, I, I don't think they're too worried about that. Um, so, lo and behold, okay, that was from October of 2001. So, here we see in the, uh, the Jew York Times, June 24th, 2018, Charles M. Blow has an opinion piece entitled, White extinction anxiety, and he goes. He goes on to say, "Last Patton, week, Patton Patton is actually a very astute political observer." Yeah, yeah, he is. Yeah. So last week, Pat Buchanan was on the uh, Laura Ingram show to discuss the humanitarian crisis Donald Trump has created at the border by ripping children away from their parents. 
He was not particularly sympathetic to these families' plights, instead choosing to focus on the demographic danger facing whiteness. Not white people, not white Americans, but just whiteness. This is, yeah, that, that's a Jewish term. Yeah, you can ring, yeah, you can ring the bell. Uh, this is the great issue of our time, and the real question is whether Europe has the will and the capacity, and America has the capacity to halt the invasion of the countries until they change the character, political, social, racial, ethnic character of the country entirely. He continued, you cannot stop these sentiments of people who want to live together with their own and they want their borders protected. Make no mistake here, Buchanan is talking about protecting white dominance, white culture, white majorities, and white power. A few days earlier on his blog, he expanded on the point. The existential question, however, thus remains. Does the West, America included, stop the flood tide of migrants before it alters forever the political and demographic character of our nations and our civilization? In describing Western liberals' aversion to instituting racist, xenophobic, and uh, to instituting racist, xenophobic immigration policies, he wrote, "We are truly dealing here what we are truly dealing here with an ideology of Western suicide." He ended with this: "Trump may be on the wrong side politically and emotionally of this issue of separating migrant kids from their parents, but on the mega issue, the third world invasion of the West." He is riding the great wave of the future if the West is to have a future. Strip all the other rationales away from this draconian immigration policy, this is at the core. White extinction anxiety, white displacement anxiety, white minority anxiety. This is the fear and anxiety Trump is playing to. Political magazine dubbed Trump, Pat Buchanan with better timing. White people have been in the majority of people considered United States citizens since the country was founded, but that period is rapidly drawing to a close. As Brookings reported last week, first, for the first time since the Census Bureau has released these annual statistics, they show an absolute decline in the nation's white, non-Hispanic population, accelerating a phenomenon that was not projected to occur until the next decade. The report continued, Second, the new numbers show that for the first time, there are more children who are minorities than who are white at every age from zero to nine. This means we are on the cusp of seeing the first minority white generation born in 2007 and later, which perhaps we can dub Generation Z+. The Applied Population Lab at the University of Wisconsin-Madison also issued a report last week that pointed out in 2016, more non-Hispanic whites died than were born in 26 states, more than at any time in U.S. history. Some 179 million residents, or roughly 56% of the U.S. population, lived in these 26 states. The report also noted that when births fail to keep pace with deaths, a region is said to have a natural decrease in population, and that a finding from previous research on natural decrease, which is consistent with our findings, is that once an area begins to experience natural decrease, the trend is likely to continue. Only California, New Mexico, and West Virginia have experienced natural increase after the onset of a decrease, and in each case it was only for a year. This is happening. America will soon be a majority minority country. White America is growing older, there are fewer white women of childbearing age, and the white fertility rate is lower than that of Hispanics and Blacks. All manner of current policy grows out of this panic over the loss of privilege and power. Immigration policy, voter suppression, Trump economic isolationist impulses, this contempt for people uh, from Haiti and Africa, the Muslim ban, his rage over Black Lives Matter and social justice protests, everything. Trump is president and is beloved by his base in part because he is unapologetically defending whiteness from anything that threatens it or at least that's the image he wants to project. It's no more complicated than that. These immigrant ch children crying out for their mothers and fathers are collateral damage. Pawns in a political battle to wring strict legislation out of con Congress. Medieval torture displays meant to serve as deterrence. As Buchanan wrote in his book, Suicide of a Superpower, which got him fired from MSNBC because of its racist overtones, 
white America is an endangered species. And he chided any white person who might cheer this nation's changing demographics. Ethnomasochism, the taking pleasure of pleasure of the dispossession of one's own ethnic group, is a disease at the heart that never afflicted the America of Andrew Jackson, Theodore Roosevelt, or Dwight Eisenhower. It comes out of what James Burnham called an ideology of Western suicide, a belief system that provides a morphine drip for people who have come to accept the inevitability of their departure from history. These immigration policies are for people who are who conflated America with whiteness and therefore a loss of white primacy becomes a loss of American identity. That's pretty damn interesting, Don. <clears throat> and it's, it's from an evolutionary point of view, it's absolutely spot on. There's no question about it. So what we've seen is, and, and again, as I've, I've stated before, I, I believe LBJ was Jewish and there was massive involvement in the, in the, the Jewish, the world Jewish community to remove President Kennedy. And then the result of that removal from office has been the demographic assault on white America. And, and the screen share, Don, so we can see you. Okay. And I will, let's see. Oh, let's see. No, hold on. Uh, let's stop. That's a very powerful piece, actually. So the, the, the intended policy of the, the Jewish immigration policy of 1965 was, in, was intended to make white Americans a minority in their own country. And now we are seeing it come to fruition. Yeah. And much the liberals on. seem to be egging it on. They seem to want it uh, faster and faster and more encompassingly as rapidly as possible. Yeah, that's what Buchanan's saying about suicide, the white suicide, who actually want it. And, so uh, anyone, yeah, anyone that finds this objectionable is a racist xenophobe. Right. And a white supremacist. White yeah. Supremacist. That's the other one. So send, like, send me the link to that article, will you, Don? Yeah, I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Yeah, it's on the New York Times opinion uh, from June 24th, and I will, Just, I will put... Just yesterday or the day before, yeah. Yeah. Well, you can always count on LBJ, huh? So, I, again, you know, that, that's, that's why I was talking about last week. Why is, you know, why do we still talk about this 54 years down the line? Because we're living with the effects of, of the JFK assassination to this very day. Yeah, the war on poverty just completely destroyed the family. Not having a, a father at home to get the benefits. It's just, Bob, um, I don't think I can copy and paste off of that. If you could, you just put it in an email for me. Yeah, I, I will email it to you. Yes. Thank you. Thank so. you very much. All right. Larry, Larry did you want to? Are we? Are we? Are we done, Gary? Or close to yeah, done? We're getting real close. You know, everybody want to have their. Did Larry want to add comments of his own about this? No, 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 uh, no, not at all. Uh, very interesting uh, thing there, uh, and I, I agree with Don that the JFK assassination set forth the. Uh, the uh, times that we live in here today, you know, uh, yeah, most definitely. That's why we do this every week. All right, fellas, JFK show number 201. We'll see you next week. All right.